Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot. Where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Welcome home, Brains. There's only one requirement to hang out on the edge, is that you open your big brain and close your small mind. Did you bring your thinking caps? It's time to put them on, because the conversation starts Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. How you doing today? I hope you're doing well because you've dropped in on the spot, the hot spot, the place where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. And today we have a fellow Toastmaster with me. This is Sharon Joseph. I'm going to talk to her about a whole lot of good stuff. She is a woman of faith. Uh, and she is living her best life at a particular age. We want to talk about that. I love to talk about that because I'm at that age too. And so many times people stranglehold us and say, oh, you know, over 40, you know, you're dead. Well, let me tell you, that's when everything kicks into overdrive. She just came back from a fabulous trip. Oh, yes, I know that she thinks I forgot, but I'm going to ask her to share some of that, uh, some of those highlights that she had with her son on a train trip. So that was pretty fun and a whole lot more. So thank you so much, Sharon, for being here with us on the edge. Please introduce yourself to my brains and tell us how you show up in the world. Hello, April. Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you and the brains out there. Hello, brains. So how I show up is authentically. And this is something that I learned the hard way, of course, as we all do. And I show up, so in the past, I used to have different personalities. At work, I was one person. At home, I was another person uh, in different situations. And then I realized that God wanted me to be one person, authentically showing up with who I am. And what I found was really, really interesting is as I started to show up authentically, it gave other people permission to show up authentically as mm. it was wow. fabulous. So you were a functional, uh, not schizophrenic, <laughs> but you did have multiple personalities. You know, I had a guest I on really my show. In, in all seriousness, I had a guest on my show that had 28 personalities. Oh my goodness. That's a lot. So oh. that takes a lot of energy to be one person here, another person there. And then, uh, yeah, it just, uh, uh, simplify it, simplify, just be you everywhere whatever you, know, you decide you are or who you decide you are but it takes time uh sharon to pull back the layers and figure out who you really are because that is an ever evolving process yes you it know, absolutely you're, is you're one thing at 10 you're another thing at 16 you're another thing at 35 when you have kids you get married so it's always changing so when people say you know i show up authentically as my true self Yes. It's just kind of hard for me to, to put that in a category because again, it's a moving target. So as you work with individuals and you work with God, what did mm -hmm. you find different at different phases of your life? You know, from your twenties to your forties to where you are now. Great question. I did not realize that I was not who I really wanted to be until I was about 39, 40 years old. So I was married at around 26. Uh, my first marriage fell apart because I didn't know who I was, what I desired in life, and I ended up settling. And the gentleman that I married, nice guy, but the wrong person for me. And as I transitioned in that life, I, I near the end, after 15 years of marriage, I I was not healthy mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually even. And finally, I sat down and I thought, is this really what life is about? Is this really what God wanted for me in my life? And the answer was a resounding no. And how I know is because God put my second husband in my life. And being a, a, a woman of faith, I thought, you know, we don't divorce our husbands. We don't do this kind of thing. And, and God said, really, really, you know, I've got a bigger journey for you. And this is not it. 
So finally, I let go of the belief systems that I had been holding on to. And I transitioned and ended up marrying my second husband who said to me, who are you? What do you want for your life? Who are you at your core? And I couldn't answer the question, mm. could not answer the question. And so that's when I started to really hone in and look at who I was. And it wasn't, I make it sound easy, but it was a painful journey. It was really painful because I had to actually face myself and say, okay, Sharon, you are responsible for where you are in your life. And you're responsible for what you did, what you didn't do, your inactions, your actions, everything. And in order to take responsibility Oh my goodness, it took a long time. It does. Well, you know, like I said, it's a swinging pendulum and it goes it, back and forth. You know, it, some it, days, or some years, you're on this incredible high. I'm doing yeah. this. I'm, you know, I'm working. I've got a career. I'm a mother, blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden, it swings back the other, the other way. And, you know, again, you find that other personality. When you were finally able to level out, yeah you know and greet the person that you are today how did that make you feel oh it was amazing it was amazing and I'm now able to ask myself the question who am I and normally when I ask that question of myself it's what I did in my career I'm a mother I'm a whatever no who am I and at my core I am peace that's who I am and everything I do revolves around maintaining that peace and being peace you know even in the drama of life because life is still happening it never stops but I'm now able to look at it from a peaceful perspective to say God is putting this in front of me why what lesson is being put in front of me at this time am I learning a lesson am I teaching a lesson am I a student am I a teacher right. because up until that point I was a victim so life was always happening to me. I gave control away so often. Everything was always everybody else's fault. I was never responsible for everything, for anything. And then when I started to take responsibility and realized that life was happening for me and not to me, I was able to find that level of peace. And I was able to say, okay, so God is throwing this my way. The universe is throwing this my way. What am I learning or what am I teaching? Right. In every situation. So I was able to find that peace and maintain it even through the rockiness of life. It's fabulous. Get it. So when that deliciousness fell upon your tongue, you started to be able to uh, communicate that. Correct. And that so is, you did absolutely. that through Toastmasters. Tell us a little bit about your experience with Toastmasters because I'm a former Toastmaster president and I love it, Brains. I tell you, it is the best um collaborative of orators and speakers and teachers and storytellers that you could ever run against. It's the best club. Uh, the, these people are your comrades. It's very competitive. You learn a lot. So tell us about your Toastmaster experience. Thank you very much for that question. I joined Toastmasters back in 2007. I had just moved to Moncton, New Brunswick, and I was looking for a community. I knew I need, I love to talk. And I realized that Toastmasters may have been an avenue available to me to not only talk, because I love to do that, mm -hmm. but also to find other people. And to your point, dollar for dollar, there is no better, no better um, program out there to help you evolve as a, a communicator, to be able to put your thoughts together succinctly, to be able to speak eloquently on top of that you actually start to fall in love with the people because as you continue to grow and evolve, you're bringing other people with you. So then you move into the leadership aspect of Toastmasters. And that's what has kept me in the organization is even though I've reached Distinguished Toastmaster, which is the top level credentials you can get, you I stayed in the organization because I love the leadership aspect and I love watching people come in and grow when you see people go from deer in the headlights mm -hmm. in giving their first speech, which in my opinion is the hardest speech ever in your Toastmaster journey Absolutely. to the point where they're crossing stage as a distinguished Toastmaster. It just, I, I love the evolution and I love watching it happen. It is. And it is, um, you know, public speaking 
is people's biggest fear. What are their it biggest? Is. <laughs> and you know, what are some tips that you would give a person that mm-hmm. has that fear? Maybe three quick bullet points that you would encourage them to work on. Great question. So number one, when you are on stage, and this is what I learned from a mentor, when you are on stage, you are the expert in the subject you are speaking about. You are the expert. And if you weren't the expert, you would not be up on stage. Number one. Number two, when I get on stage, I recognize from the beginning, there are much smarter people more eloquent people out there, and I will leverage their knowledge and their experience in helping me to present the best speech that I can possibly give. So I deliberately incorporate them into my presentations because I know they have something to share. And in order for me me to be able to do that, point number three is never let your ego get involved in your presentation. When you come from the heart space and not the head space, you will always give the best presentation you possibly can. And the key is to touch one person's life, just one. I'm not looking to shift everybody. I'm looking to put one person in their heart space and I know I have succeeded. So those would be my three points. Those are beautiful. Mine are to really command presence of the audience. Like you say, stand there on the stage. No one knows what you're going to say until you say it. Exactly. To slow down. And don't go out there and say, this is my very first speech and I'm nervous. Again, people don't know that. And it takes the uh, the edge off of the presentation. There's no excitement because now they've got to kind of build up. You want to start them at the top. And three, be cautious of your filler words. We all use um, uh, you know, and if another young person uses the word like, Shan, I'm going to come up out the ground. Every other word is like, like this. Well, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, baby, it's like, what? So watch that. And you can do that by practicing your speech, by practicing your presentation. Don't worry about how many people are in the audience. Look at the first five or six in the front row. Engage, give them eye contact, pause, smile. They teach you all these tics, uh, tips and tricks. And when they do that, you will become a stellar orator. So that is wonderful. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for that. You talk a lot about your walk with God. Yes. And I just want to touch on this just a little bit. And brains, this goes for any religious doctrine. I'm not going to pick one over the other. It is a personal, intimate relationship. Yes, we go to the synagogue or the temple or, you know, the church because we want the camaraderie. We want the fellowship. And we look towards the person that stands there at the lectern or in the pulpit as a person of reverence and respect. But they are all human beings just like we are. And the dog agrees with you. (laughs) Uh, Because dog is God spelled backwards. Yes, it is. (laughs) I get it. But people forget that they have a responsibility to themselves to be authentic and not necessarily be controlled. Religion can be very controlling. It can be very dominating. It can be confusing. It can be misleading. When you are in that sacred space um, with your God, Mm -hmm. how does that make you feel? It gives me the comfort and safety of knowing that I am not in control. Mm -hmm. I'm not in control. So what message that I got from God, and I appreciate the context that you provided there, because God is in everything. It doesn't, it, it, it really is the relationship you have to your God, right. whatever that is. And what I found is because I was running on that treadmill of life so fast, God said to me one day, you must slow down to speed up. 
-hmm. I didn't understand what that meant until I went into meditation and I started to breathe. And of course, the breath is the power. God breathed life into us. And in, in, in any religion, they talk about the power of the breath. So when, when we take that deep breath and we start to really go within and have that communication with God, and God said to me, creator is the other word that I use, creator said to me, you must slow down to speed up. And it took me a while to figure that out. And when creator said that to me, I must slow down this thing to speed up my heart space. Mm. Because God also and creator also taught me if I want to do anything, if I desire to do anything, I must come from the heart because when the heart is engaged, the head makes it work. If I come from my head space and my heart's not engaged, it's not going to last. It's going to fall apart. And rightly so, because when you come from the heart space, you're coming from who you are at your core. And this is a desire. It's a passion. And it will keep you going through the hard times. The brain's going to figure it out. The brain already knows what to do. It'll figure it out. But as long as the heart's in game. You made three very key points that I want to touch on. The first one is the breath. The breath was our very first gift and it will be our last. Correct. That is what we have to work with. I've been working with my husband on learning how to syncopate his breathing. You know, I hear him at night just breathe from the upper torso. Yep. I told him, I said, you need to go down to the abdomen, brother. <laughs> you Absolutely. Gotta go you got to go down. Absolutely. No question. Another thing that you touched on was you talked about um, in meditation. I had a very deep meditation a few weeks ago, and God told me to surrender. Yes. I thought yes. he was talking to somebody else. I said, there must be somebody else here in the room because I've been fighting hard. You know, I've got a, a situation going on with the city. And I have been struggling, really. And yep. God said, you know what? I got you, baby. Just surrender. Great, great. So right I, on. I, oh, you, know, you, you don't have to keep fighting the fight. You've made your point. People have heard you. Now give me an opportunity to work it out for you. Yes. Because yes. we always kind of want to take control back. We when, do. But it's an oxymoron. You can't take control and and you know be a be a victim at the same time it just doesn't work that way so you have to you have to work that out but also having courage and it sounds like you developed a lot of courage because you have to be brave to give it over to someone else you yeah. have to be brave to have faith and walk by faith and not by sight you know you have to be brave to accept the consequences and the reality of your actions and reactions and be accountable for it. You know, it is all make part. choices. We all make choices and yeah. how we react to something is a choice we make. Exactly. Well, you made another brave choice. You told me that at one point you were over 300 pounds. Yes, ma'am. I don't <laughs> believe it. I don't <laughs> believe it. I was, oh my goodness. I was uh, close, 330 pounds at my heaviest. Wow. 330 so, pounds, yeah. What uh, what sparked you to go on this massive weight loss journey? Because that's a complete transformation. And then I want to hear a little bit about the person that greeted you on the other side of that. Oh, great question. Great question. When I married my first husband, I had always been roughly about 160, 170 pounds through high school. So a little chubby uh, in today's standards, I guess about normal. Um, when I married my first husband is when I started to crescendo in my weight gain because I ate emotions. I didn't realize I was an emotional eater. I gained weight, didn't even realize I had gained weight because I never looked at myself, never. I would look in the mirror enough to put eye makeup on and my makeup and everything else, but I never looked at myself really in the eyes or anything down here. When I went to buy clothes, it was always a shocker that I had to go up a size or two till finally I ballooned up to a point where it I had given up. I wore baggy clothes. 
I wore black thinking, oh, it made me look slimmer. The only person I was fooling was myself. And I actually was wearing tents. Nothing, the clothes didn't suit me at all. But at that point I had given up, I didn't care. I was in a loveless marriage. I didn't think anybody else would desire me as an individual. I didn't love myself. I actually hated myself. So, and I treated myself th that way. When I met my second husband, he actually liked large women. And I didn't know that existed out there. I thought everybody but would prefer. Yes, big girls need love too, baby. <laughs> Absolutely. And he appreciated me for who I was at the size that I was. And so that started me on the journey to self-love. He brought just a tremendous journey in, and he put it in front of me. Who are you? Who do you desire to be? Who are you at your core? And that started the journey. So through my marriage with him, I ended up healing mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Wow. And my last body, there were four bodies, was the physical. And as I started to heal the physical, unfortunately, my husband got sick and ended up dying. And at his death, I saw a picture of me and him together towards the end of his life. And I got old with him. He was 18 years older than I was. So I knew I'd be a widow at some point in my life, but I didn't realize I would be so young being a widow. As he got old and grayed, I allowed myself to get old and gray as well. So under this wonderful hair color is actually a lot of gray. And I allowed myself to go au naturel as I called it. My eyebrows were gray, my hair was gray, and I got old. And after he passed away, and I went through a year of just intense mourning for that loss, after a year, I finally woke up and, and creator said to me, okay, Sharon, time to come back to life because you have more life to live and it's time for you to become who you desire to be as you said earlier this is a new phase of life who am I in this new phase of life that is when I decided that my physical being had to now match my mental emotional and spiritual being so I had to get healthy at that point I knew that I needed to take a drastic step because at 330 pounds, it was going to be a lot too much at that point for my body to release. So I had bariatric surgery and went through the journey. In a couple of years, I ended up releasing uh, almost 190 pounds now. Then from there, there was excess skin. So I went through surgery to have that removed. And now I'm at a point in my life where I'm physically very healthy mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So all my bodies are aligned. Uh, I feel great. I have a great hairdresser. Yeah, I, you <laughs> know, you thing look for me. I mean, you thank look, you. Thank you very much. You, really look, you know, your eyes are bright and your dimples are, are, are blaring. <laughs> so now with all this fabulosity. Yes, ma'am. Did you see any suitors on the train? <laughs> and her son went on a train trip and it was the Rocky Mountain Rail, correct? It was part of it was the Rocky Mountaineer. The other part was Ottawa or Ottawa to Toronto overnight in Toronto, then Toronto to Vancouver, four days. And part of that was that Jasper to Vancouver run, which is the Rocky Mountaineer through the Rocky Mountains. I got to see this big, beautiful country, Canada. Loved oh, it. Let me tell you, I, I took my family on it, and we went in the winter. We're coming back up there in the summer. Yes, ma'am. It ma is the best. It, it is. The best. It's not like a cruise. It's not like a car trip. It, and didn't they feed you good? <laughs> oh God, the food is phenomenal. The food is my phenomenal. Goodness. It really is. It really so what was. What were some of the highlights of the trip? I know your son. And tell us a little bit about your son, because I saw him in his in his conductor uh, costume and his bandana. He looked like he was having the best time ever. My son is a one of the reasons why I learned to show up authentically. He is on the autism spectrum. Mm. He has raised me well. I remember the examples that he showed me on how to be who you are and not care what people think. He does not care. 
He will dress the way he wants to dress. He's a colorful individual. He loves rainbows. So he will wear the most colorful outfits ever. And he is always showing up as him. And he's a train fanatic. Growing up, the train was how I communicated with him. Thomas the Tank Engine was okay. one of the methodologies that we used to communicate because he was nonverbal for quite a while. When he started to talk, we talked engines. And of course, he's never lost the love of trains. When he, when I told him I was taking him on this trip for Christmas, he put together this conductor outfit. He was wearing it in the train station in Toronto when we were waiting to board. He was spotted by the conductor. <gasps> and the conductor, whose name was Dave as well, took him to the front of the train. And this was a 16, the, the train had 16 cars in it, three engines. He took him to the very front. They got him to climb up into the, the cockpit of the train. And that's where the conductor and the engineer showed him how to work the, the, the train and all the mechanisms and everything. And on the train itself, he wore his outfit. The woman who was taking care of our, a uh, sleeper car gave him a spike that she had embossed in gold um, in, in gold, and given it to him as a gift because of his outfit. Oh. And he had magical moments because he showed up authentically. He was wearing his outfit. He loved the trip and made it so much better for me because I got to see the world through his eyes. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. a magical place to be, magical. Oh. And the highlight, of course, was meeting all of the other people on. Oh, the I know. He was like the celebrity. He, he was. was. He was. was celebrity. And you know what? He will never forget that. He will never. No. And he talks about it, and we're already planning our next one. We're going to do it in the summer. And this time, we're actually going to get off the train and spend a few days here and there then get back on and, and tra traverse this beautiful country that we call Canada. Oh, well, you are just doing amazing, amazing things. Now, are you working with other individuals to help them settle in and make the transition of life? I am helping them. I do help people understand perceptions. That's a big thing. I'm a truth guru because what I learned from my own experience, when I'm looking at an experience in front of me, I will perceive it from beliefs and experiences I've had in the past. Then what I will do is change my perception from being a victim to being a student or a teacher and understand the truth there, what I'm expected to learn or teach. Then as I'm starting to feel the emotions, figure out where the emotions are coming from, heal that so that every time I see a situation, I perceive it with no emotion connected to it. Wow. And when there's no emotion, I know that I've learned what I need to learn and it just moves through my right. perception into the past. It makes, I do clear, help people. it makes you a clear conduit. A clear it conduit. does. It and really a lot does. of times people are clogged because they get to a certain point and then judgment kicks in. It does. It absolutely does. So I'm empathetic to people's situation. I am not sympathetic. And the difference, the way I perceive it, empathetic, I can look at something that's in front of you without the emotion connected. When I'm sympathetic, I'm actually in the mire with you emotionally. And that provides no value to anyone whatsoever. I will allow you to stay in that emotion for a little bit. Then what I do is I kick you out of the pity party move you into the empathetic to say, what is life teaching you? What are you supposed to learn here and help you to change your perception? If you are willing to do that, there are people who love being in the mire. And if they choose not to shift, then I leave them where they are, love them unconditionally and move them on in life and let them know that I'm here when they're ready to change. But that comes also from your... Um your analytical experience of being an IT project manager. Yes, ma'am. You understand the bits, the bites, the nuances. Correct. But also the science and the methodology. That is correct. So bravo, bravo. You have been able to incorporate all these things and creating the best life for yourself. 
familiar at this point, living fabulously, looking good, lost the way, traveled across the country in a train. Your son is happy. Where do you see Sharon in the next five years? Oh, I am hitting the road. I am hitting the road. I am very blessed to have built a career and a life that I can take on the road with me. And my next journey, as a matter of fact, creator and I had a conversation a couple of days ago. I am now ready and creators now asking me to go visit all of the sacred sites around the world oh, and meet all of the wonderful people connected to those sacred sites so that I can experience and God can experience through my journey what it was like to live in those times and how to bring the magic back, how to really connect with the energy from that space and that time and bring that back into this space and time. There's there's a lot of strife going on. Oh, yes. Right? And it's time for God to bring or to play a really important role in our lives at this time. Whatever God looks like for you, it's time for us to find that peace, to find that balance, to find that center that will help us transition back into a real divine place for us to begin living our lives again. It's time for us to get out of the head and start living from the heart. But you would have thought that people would have resonated with that during COVID. They did for a minute. It was the perfect pause. It, it was, was the, the perfect pause. World, the entire world had to stop. It did. For almost two years. And yes. now people are back to their same old trickery. You know, they really are. So here's my perception on that. I have met a lot of people. I've I've not only traveled across Canada, I've been on on multiple trips this the in 2023. And people at their core want something better. They they they're loving people, but our media is portraying a very negative space for people. And we have to be really, really careful that we don't buy into the stories that the media is portraying. They are creating, yeah. I work in television. And the first right. thing I tell the audience is that we are here to create. Yes. Not, not deliver, not report. Absolutely. We are here to create an emotion. We it's, are here to make uh, this sensational. Yes. yes. And you know what the best thing you can do is I turn it on to make sure I'm not in harm's way. I turn it off. I listen. I, yes. I, I do not up. watch the news. I do not. Uh, social media, I limit the social media and what I look at. I have not had cable television in 30 years. I don't read a newspaper. I deliberately stay away from that. If I need to know something, creator puts it in front of me. And that's what I need to know. And perhaps it's a simplistic view of life. Maybe it's the rose colored glasses. It's what I do to keep my peace. That is who I am. That is where I desire to live. I have met a lot of people over the last number of years. Everybody at their core comes from their heart. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your religion is. We all at our core want peace and we want love in our lives. That's who we are. So be careful who you listen to. Be careful the stories you believe in and be careful what uh, life you buy into because to your point April I love what you said we create life whatever that looks like to us we are the creators of life and if we allow everybody to dictate to us who we are what we're supposed to do how we're supposed to live whatever we give our power away and we're left because when they go away and and start doing what they're doing we're left with us exactly if and we're left are, with ourselves you are what you eat brains you absolutely are you, are who you hang around i tell my daughter that all the time you know she was going through a, a period of where she was very anxious and i said this is not your character you're pretty easy going you're easy to talk to you know you have good reasoning ability and now all of a sudden you're tense and you're nervous and all that and i said what's that coming from well you know my friends are a sissy you have to watch that you have to be careful of the outside noise and the influences that you pour into your life. You're absolutely right. And I know 
your your brains are smart and I know they're smart because they're listening to you and they're listening to your podcast and you've got some incredible speakers that have come onto your podcast and have started talking about this kind of thing and your brains know they know the difference between bringing in stories to buy into and building their authentic lives and and building the life that they choose to live your brains are smart because you're following a podcast that comes from the heart that is authentic and is real be well, careful the to, influence you allow i want us to be like a sifter you know i want you to yeah. be able to edit and filter get the lumps out Absolutely. And go with the pure powder that just blows in the air. So before we conclude, I'm going to ask some fun questions. I always like to answer these fun questions. If you were an appliance in the kitchen, Miss Sharon, what appliance would you be? And why? <laughs> what a great question. Of course, my first thought is the ninja. I would be the ninja blender. I the get a lot of blenders. I get a lot of blenders. Do you really? I oh, a lot of people, a lot of people want to chop it up. They want to mix it up. They want to put it all together. But you know what I want to be? What I'm would you be, like to be? I'd be the air fryer. <laughs> oh, do share. Why would you be the air fryer? I would be the air fryer because it's quick. It's clean. You use a little bit of grease. It's still crispy. I love it. I love it. That's, that's okay, like life. Nice. I want it to be crispy. If you were a flower in the garden. What flower would you be, Miss Joseph? I would be, good question. I would be the daffodil, actually, because the daffodil shows up early and brings hope that there's better times coming. Mm, that's beautiful. Right. That's beautiful. Great question. Uh, if you were an animal, what animal would you be? I would be a dog. I've often said when I die, I want to come back as a dog in my family because my dogs are well treated. They're unconditional love. They love me even when I'm having a bad day. They're there for me at all times. I would be a dog for sure. Well, I, again, <laughs> you're very connected because all dogs go to heaven and dog is God spelled backwards. It absolutely is. I would be the party animal. Oh, yes. <laughs> What a great answer. I would be the party <laughs> animal. I would rock it till the wheels fall off. <laughs> if you were a car, what kind of car would you be? I would be a Ferrari. No question. No question. Sleek, fast, quiet, understated class Ferrari. That looks like you. You know what I'd be? I'd be a 1970 VW van. <laughs> All painted out with the flowers. <laughs> I'd have a mattress in the back. I'd have, it, I'd have a bomb. <laughs> and life would be good. Absolutely. Need carpets on the side. And, and that would be me. That oh. Play the Beatles, baby. Oh, yeah. Some Rolling Stones. Oh, yeah. That, that's how we would travel. We'd caravan across Canada. Absolutely. Fantastic. But in all sincerity, Queen. What do you want your legacy to be? How do you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered as a kind person who was peace and could be relied on in moments of need. If you wanted to talk about anything, I'm a good listener. I can help you with perspective if you desire that. I could be just that friend that's non-judgmental that you could share anything with. And of course, it's not my story to tell, so it, it wouldn't go any further. That's the type of legacy I would leave behind. I would love to leave behind. The person who touched a life, and the, I believe in the power of one, because if I can touch one life, how many lives are they touching? And so on and so on. So that's who I, that's the legacy I'd love to leave behind. Well, you're gonna do a great job because you are a great storyteller. You are compassionate. You are not only um, talking the talk, but you have walked the walk. Okay? Thank and you I'm very much. So proud of you. Uh, please tell my brains how to get in contact with you. They want to work with you. They want to consult with you uh, or they want to follow you on social media. Fantastic. So my email, my website is SharonJoseph.ca. 
My email is Sharon at SharonJoseph.ca. And of course, you can send me an email through my website. On my website is also my phone number and all my social uh, media links, Sharon Joseph CA, generally on uh, across all the platforms. I would love to hear from the brains and see if there's anyone out there that I could help listen to, come in contact with. Of course, I learn from your stories as well. I'm a student always looking to learn to evolve and to grow and hopefully help you on your journey as well. Well, we're going to blossom like a daffodil dealing with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Brains, did you get all of that information? Okay. I hope you brought a crane because it was pretty heavy. It was some heavy lifting. Thank you so much for being here with me. I ask you to please go in and love, like, share, and subscribe. Love, like, share, and subscribe. Leave a comment. Leave a question. Uh, that's how me and Sharon evolve. That is how we are going to give you what you need. Maybe that is how we need to go back and reprocess or revisit some things that we've thought about. So thank you so much for being here on the edge. And brains, um, I love you from the bottom of my socks because my heart just isn't deep enough. Bye.